welcome to First Impressions, the podcast where we talk about our love for Jane Austen and give the big middle finger to all the haters. I am Kristen and I am joined by Maggie. Hi, everybody. (laughs) And we are welcoming today a guest onto our podcast, my friend, my Twitter buddy, Adrian, who I am thrilled to know and see in person for the first time ever. We all have these Twitter friends and they're all so dear to our heart and we light up whenever we see their handle that they liked our tweet. I'm like, yes, I don't. I'm not on Twitter. Adrian liked it. And her handle is at barely tolerable, right? That's right. Yep. I, which I thought was hysterical the first time I saw it and have loved it ever since. So, and Adrian is a massive North and South fan. So when I tweeted that we were thinking of doing a North and South episode, she immediately was like, oh my gosh, I have to be involved. And I was so thrilled because I am not a Gaskell expert and we really need her expertise. And in addition, she is has a master's degree in English, and she is a fanfic writer, I believe, of North and South fanfic exclusively. I know, and Pride and Prejudice. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So welcome, Adrian. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on here. I'm a fan of the podcast. So when you said you were doing an episode, I was totally excited to come on. <laughs> yeah, yes. And, and we need you. And in fact, I have to also give you props because you are the reason that I decided to read North and South. Yay. I'm always really happy to hear that. (laughs) Somebody tweeted, what are the best lines? And you responded with two such good lines that I was like, whoa, that's awesome. I need to read this book. And one of them is that beautiful line about Margaret saying, he is my first olive. You must allow me to make a face while I swallow it. (laughs) Yes. That I have that highlighted multiple times, like underlined in my copy of the book. And I'm so sad that it doesn't make it to the mini series. <laughs> it's a great line. What was the other line, Kristen? You don't remember, but it was hot. See, the thing about <laughs> North and South, the book is the language is so sexual, not explicitly sexual, but um, people are always flushed and clinging and, and I don't know, Breathing panting, and- panting, <laughs> yes, yes, panting. And, and, and the language is so much is so much closer to like the romance novel language of today. It's what people think Jane Austen is who yeah. haven't read Jane Austen. And I was unprepared for how sexy it was. And it was only it's when I realized that when I when you shared those beautiful, beautiful quotes that I knew I had to read it and it was so worth it. Um, Mr. Thornton is very thirsty for Margaret in the parlance of our time. It's just it's it comes out a lot in the miniseries, obviously, but it's just a hundred percent more in that book because we get to hear all his thoughts yes maybe I should read this book oh my god it's amazing I did I haven't read it I have to be honest well and it you know it does it it does of course talk about the stuff social problem stuff union stuff and like others like her contemporaries Gaskell does write some dialogue in the heavy accent she writes it phonetically in like a Manchester accent of the day. Oh, no. <laughs> it, it is really As hard. As someone who has talked to people from Manchester? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, all of Higgins's dialogue is like that. And so oh it, it slows a reader down, I think, of quite a bit. <laughs> I struggled, but it was so worth it. And I, um, I'm enjoying reading it a second time right now with my Norton Critical Edition uh, book. And I definitely recommend getting the annotated book. You're going to want... Oh, some explanation of that stuff. Well, I feel uh, right off the bat, I feel the need to defend myself because I have mentioned that the union subplots and things are not my favorite part of the miniseries, but it's not like I hate that. I mean, I thought about going into labor law when I left law school. So like, I'm not opposed to it. I just wanted to get to the hot Richard Armitage action. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a red blooded American woman. (laughs) I do. (laughs) I totally understand. And and I, I kind of just meant because page after page of really hard to read dialogue, plus not sexy dialogue. It's, it's, it's sometimes it sounds hard. like it'll make a great audiobook. Yes. No, I'm, I'm sure it would. Um, Mr. But- Thornton takes a long time to show up in the book. I, when I first read it, I was like, where's Mr. Thornton? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. So you were a first miniseries watcher and then novel reader. I was. Yeah. So um, I can talk about how I got into it, which was in like the spring of 2020, when COVID hit, we went into lockdown in California. And um, I was working from home. So that means I didn't have like a commute or anything. So I had a lot of free time, everything's closed, right? Um, So there's a lot of free time. But also, 
I got back into Jane Austen during this time. So I had studied Jane Austen as an undergrad um, a bit, and I started watching the 2005 Pride and Prejudice like weekly. I reread all the (laughs) novels. Like I was really drawn to the comfort of Jane Austen during um, the first part of the pandemic. And uh, that also involved getting in, uh, sorry, that involved getting more involved with the online fandom community, which I hadn't been part of. And so like I found Drunk Austin and I found Bianca through that. And then I found the Facebook groups and all that. And then there was like a bunch, there's a bunch of Jane Austen meme pages. And on one of these pages, I saw this uh, meme that was like a Goodreads review of North and South. And it just said Pride and Prejudice for Socialists. And I just laughed. <laughs> and I was that like, what? sounds like something I want to read. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, that's intriguing. That that sounds interesting. And then I realized that there was a miniseries. And then like very few Googling involved to find out that this miniseries was like beloved. And then um, I had to check it out from my library because it wasn't streaming anywhere. So I checked out the DVD from my library. And actually, when we uh, picked it up from the library, there's this blurb on the back of the DVD. And it says something like, packed with passion, tension, class warfare, and smoldering sexual energy. I was going to say smoldering. It has to say smoldering because there's a lot of smoldering in this. So much. And so I was like, (laughs) yes, I watched it like that Uh, day. I watched it that day. I watched it in two days. Um, I watched it again, like just like the next day. So I watched it really in quick succession twice. And I was just like totally hooked. And so I'm like, I have to read the book. And um, I read the book and kept that. I renewed that DVD for months. Like nobody was checking it out. Girl, just get it on Amazon. I know. I actually don't own the DVD. What I do instead is subscribe to BritBox just so I can watch it on demand all the time. You had a much more productive lockdown than I did because all I did was like drink wine, eat chocolate and get pregnant. But you're like, I reread all of Jane Austen's collected works. I got into like (laughs) all these classical (laughs) literature. I read, I started writing fanfic too. You write, Um, you wrote your own fanfic. Yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting in that way because I thought, well, I really reverted to like my 14 year old self, to be honest. Like I, it was exactly the interest I had when I was a teenager. I hadn't written any fanfic in like 13 years. And so I started reading Pride and Prejudice fan fiction, wrote something, made some friends there. And then um, eventually by the time I got to North and South, it's like, I haven't written anything in Pride and Prejudice since. So North and South has totally like overtaken my interest. (laughs) Oh, that's so great though. You basically like found a new community. Yes. Yes. And we're mighty. We're small, but mighty, um, on Twitter, on Facebook, all of, all over the place. There's this great North and South quotes account on Instagram that I follow that just is like really nice mashups of like the parts with, uh, Margaret and Thornton. And then they put a quote from the book which is also super smoldery too. And I, I read all their posts. I always get excited when I scroll past one. Okay, yeah, what's it called? Because I'm going to look it up right now. I think it's called it. North and South Quotes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There. Once you start looking, North and South fans are everywhere. And I have to actually apologize to Maggie. Maggie showed me North and South way long ago. I did. That's right. I forgot. And you didn't like it. I didn't like it. I was this such bitch. A, <laughs> this is shocking. I was such a Pride and Prejudice fan. I was so obsessed with the 1995 movie. And the thing about North and South, this is very ignorant of me, but I assumed that Gaskell was trying to write a Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. Even the name North and South, I didn't realize that was a, a common naming convention. So I was like, she's trying to do a Pride and Prejudice thing. And then Thornton and, you know, there's Pride and there's Prejudice. That's fair. I think that's fair though. You would think if you didn't know the context of her novel, I think that's a fair thing to like assume. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. And I saw so many parallels, but instead of making me like it, I was like, this is shittier. I like mm-hmm. Pride and Prejudice better because it's funnier and it's wittier. And I, I am more emotionally, and I would prefer to see Colin Firth than rather than Richard Armitage, which is Ooh, a bad opinion call. now. I, it is, a, it is a trash opinion. I don't know why I held it, <laughs> but anyway, it was like, and it's, you know, it's like when someone else tell, shows you something that they really love and they're like, there's like a lot of pressure to love it. And you're like, I don't know, for yeah. some reason you have the opposite reaction, which is not usually the way I'm like with Maggie, but for whatever reason, I must have just had a bitchy day. So I was Maybe like, you this felt like <laughs> I was trying, it's like uh, someone trying to, like when one of your parents gets remarried, you thought I was trying to like, replace. yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, yes. Now you have to love Elizabeth Gaskell. And I was like, I don't have time in my life to love Elizabeth Gaskell. 
Do you remember when that was Kristen? Because I do not. And you wanted us to, you sent me a thing where like, we'll talk about how we first got into it. And I literally don't remember. I don't remember where I first saw it, how I got the DVD. Cause I'm old now and I don't remember <laughs> these things. I've just always loved that movie, but I don't remember. You know, you and your mom are just like really good British TV watchers and masterpiece watchers. And maybe you just saw it there. And that must've been what it was. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I don't understand now why I didn't immediately bond to it. Cause it's so amazing. And like watching it again and reading the book again, you know, ha- after having read the book, I wa- went back and revisited the mini series and I was just like, this is so sexy. I was like, so into it. This is so amazing. Uh, <laughs> not just because it's sexy. It's amazing for a lot of reasons, but that was the hook, right? Like the great chemistry. And I think that's what makes this a uh, mini series for the ages, like Pride and Prejudice, where we wear out our DVD copies. Isn't that what happened to you, Maggie? Did you? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I did wear it out. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying... I wore this. I, there's very few DVDs I've worn out. North and South, I had to replace. Um, and then Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, the scene where Sean Bean is like running up to save the hobbits oh, after he's yeah. redeemed himself, you know? So great. Um, yeah, I had to replace that, got worn out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't remember that part that I think it was, I guess, the end of part one, maybe, was the part where it, it got worn out. But Richard yeah. Armitage is like, it's not a surprise to me that he became pretty like a star. Like my mom knows who Richard Armitage is. That's my, like, how do I know if someone's famous? Does my mother know who they are? I'm so glad because I think he's fantastic in this. And he, amazing. he broke the BBC website. One of the like interesting and fun things about it is that, so this is aired in 2004 and that's like old internet, right? Where we had right. forums. We weren't all just on Twitter or Reddit or whatever. And I guess what happened was the servers went down because everyone rushed to the BBC website message boards to talk <laughs> about this mini series after the first episode and the servers could not handle it. And so there was always sort of an internet community around North and South in a way. Uh, and it was serialized over like four weeks. Um, mm-hmm. And it, that's to me is kind of interesting because we're still doing the same thing on Twitter, <laughs> talking about Richard Armitage and his performance in this. <laughs> I've just, I'm like, it's the same thing with Sean Bean with me, where I saw them in something on Masterpiece and then just became obsessed with them and would watch anything they were in. And every time he popped up in something, like he was in Vicar of Dibley and I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. And then when he got the role in The Hobbit, I was like, yes, he's one of the hot dwarves. Now everyone will know who he is. And he does a lot of (laughs) voice work and he's great with doing voice work, like in Castlevania on Netflix. And he does, he plays Wolverine in a podcast. He's just really great. I I think that he and the actress who plays Margaret, although she has not been in as many things, um, they're just so good. Daniela Denby Ash. The cast, the whole cast is really great. Yeah. And of course it's not a weak link. Yeah, we were talking about this before. It's the first time I've seen, oh, let me look up their names. I always have IMDB open when we're talking about stuff. What did I say her name was? Anna, yes, Anna Maxwell Martin. Oh. Um, and then who's the guy from Downton? Brendan Coyle. Brendan Coyle, right? These are like big names. <laughs> yeah. And and Kevin, my husband, by the way, also loves this mini series for the really? for the exact opposite reasons of me. But he was so excited. He was walking around, Mr. Bates. <laughs> Mr. Bates. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Hale. <laughs> he, he just knows him from Downton Abbey. And we always used, but yeah, no, he loved this mini series too. And it was because of the Mr. Bates character and Richard Armitage and their chemistry yes. in that last the episode romance. when they when they sort of get together and become friends and start talking about solutions, which is, start is working really together. uplifting. Um, he actually said to me at one point, like these two, I can't stop smiling. And then just today, just, you know, 20 minutes ago, I was, I was watching, uh, I was binging the whole mini series today, but I ran out of time. And so I finally got to the last scene about 10 minutes before this podcast is starting. So I was like very intent on it. Cause I wasn't going to get to rewind it. I was just going to get to see it the one time. So I'm zero focused in on it. And of course, right then my husband comes up the stairs and in typical fashion, he has to make a joke. So he's like, you know, it would be really sexy is if instead of Margaret, it was Mr. Bates there and they were making out. And <laughs> I, be sexy. I was, I, I just looked at him and I said, are you talking to me right now? <laughs> I, he said, who would talk during this 
seen. This is, I was like, my loins are being stirred by this yes. like delightful kiss. And like, you're making a dumb joke. I also banned my husband. He loves <laughs> the miniseries too, but it's like, you don't make a joke during the train scene. I know you just you guys, do not mess with the train scene. You guys I'm having flashbacks. So Kristen, yes, I do remember I was in my townhouse in Williamsburg in law school because I remember after I saw it, I went on to like the earliest version of YouTube and was like re-watching <laughs> that scene <laughs> over and over. Adrian, didn't you say that there's an idea of someone redoing this scene but cutting out the one shot of Henry Lennox when yes. he's just like, oh, yes. <laughs> like, yeah, fool, it's Richard Armitage. What did you think was going to happen? Yeah, that's <gasps> something we want to manifest, like a sans Henry like cut of the. Of the thing. But you have to have him just looking kind of sad and then being like, well. All right, I guess I'm just going home. <laughs> it just sort of hands to her carpet bag. Like yeah, he okay. doesn't even like he doesn't even say yeah, he's like, yeah, you know. I, I, I know competition. You're not gonna you, you guys got compromised, first of all. Yeah, yeah <laughs> pretty much. Over. It's yeah. Over. <laughs> I see that guy's stiff collar. I know when I've been uh <laughs> okay. Totally but- different from the from the ending in the book. And I think um I'm never, ever going to say I don't like the train scene ending, but I love the ending in the book too. So it's kind of interesting the things they decided to change. Yeah. Well, now, now that you've brought it up, compare and compra- contrast the two scenes for people who haven't read the book. So um, in the book, we have um, Mr. Thornton who has essentially lost his mill. He's going out of business. He comes to London to like give up the paperwork or whatever. And Margaret at this point is his landlady. And so he goes to talk to Henry Lennox, her solicitor. And Henry's like, hey, do you want to come for dinner? And which is bad move on his part. And so Mr. Thornton goes to dinner at um, Edith's house or whatever. And he sees Margaret there. And both of them are just like totally awkward. They're not can't look at each other. Margaret's like stealing glances and is like, oh, he looks so sad and like older because his mill's gone or whatever. And then Margaret wants to uh, uh, invest in the mill. So she off- she wants to offer him his 15,000 pounds. There's this great scene right before that, though. There's this great part where... Um, she he tells her that his workers had like filled out made a list of their names so that if he's able to reopen the mill um, they can they want to work for him and um, he tells Margaret about it and it's really the only time they actually speak to each other at that dinner and she's like well he asked her like that was good right and she's like yeah I think it was great and he's like I knew you would and I'm just like oh my gosh like I need to see that exchange on film somewhere Um, and then she's like come the next day so we could talk about this like business proposition and Henry's supposed to be there the next day and he just doesn't show up, which is really great on Gaskell's part. She's just like, Henry's not there. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Thornton and uh, Margaret are by themselves. And she's like, listen, I want to invest in the mill. And he calls her name and they have like this moment. And she's like, you know, I'm not good enough for you. And he's like, don't make fun of me. I'm not good enough for you. And then there's like these few minutes of delicious silence. And he shows her that Helston Rose and it's it's really beautiful. And it wraps up in like, a minute. It's literally a page long. Um, very abrupt, but very romantic. Um, not quite as visually exciting as I think the train station is, but um, in similar fashion, um, very, I mean, there's definitely kissing, I think, when we have that delicious silence. I ha- Yes, I have. So I have so many things to say about this. So I feel like it happens relatively rarely when a screenwriter has an idea that I feel like if the author were alive, she would have been like, yes, I'm stealing mm-hmm. that and I'm using it in my book. Because the train thing, not only is it symbolic, right? Because they're moving, they're moving in the direction, you know, one was it, they're they're going north and south respectively. They meet but, in the middle. And they meet in, yeah, they kind of meet in the middle. But but the fact that she goes with him and they leave on the northbound train together is also symbolic of the like the progress that she's now interested in moving towards, right? Like a, a new I new idea is questioning as they just established, right, in that episode at the end where where she's sort of arguing against the old Southern sensibility. Yeah. And I just thought it was so beautiful. Uh, I remember reading the very last few pages of the, the book. And I actually have it here because I wanted to read this passage is that we keep saying that the the language is sexy. So I marked a few passages. So if we do talk about them, I have them right away to read. Okay. But you have to read them in your like romance voice, your, your bedroom voice, Kristen. (laughs) I just, Adrian said he calls her name and he does. And that's the beginning of what you think is going to be the 
big payoff, right? Like, yes, I can't wait for this big romantic scene that goes on and on and on. And we get to be sexy and happy together. And then right after he calls her name, it's just like, this is the end, right? So while she sought for this paper, her very heart pulse was arrested by the tone in which Mr. Thornton spoke. His voice was hoarse and trembling with tender passion as he said, Margaret. For an instant, she looked up and then sought to veil her luminous eyes by dropping her forehead on her hands. Again, stepping nearer, he besought her with another tremulous, eager call upon her name. Margaret. I don't know. It was sexy. I (laughs) I don't think I'm saying Margaret right. How do you say Margaret in a tremulous, hoarse way? Um, But uh, yeah. Considering it's my name. And then they have, uh, I'm not good at, you know, not good enough. Don't mock my own deep feelings of unworthiness. And then they just, it's just a a, a small exchange between them. And they say, oh my God, what will my mom think? Oh my God, what will my aunt think? They'll both hate this. The end. (laughs) (laughs) But as you're reading that, I'm just grinning from ear to ear because it's, it is really hot and it's it's like all this tension for 400 pages or so or four hours and we get this um very short release of that tension to be fair in the miniseries it's pretty good um but it is very short it is short well and the thing about it is one thing about this movie is what frustrated me the first time I see it is we we get almost no scenes where they are nice to each other in any way yeah we know how they feel about each other mainly because of what they say to other people about each other, which is usually positive or um, an affirmation in that person's inherent goodness or kindness or um, integrity. But then when they actually face with each other, their philosophical differences come out so fast and just devolve into these fights that are certainly emotionally engaging but frustrating to the the viewer who of course knows that they're meant for each other and wants to see them fall into each other's arms. And one thing about Richard Armitage in that final train scene is that he knows how to make his face. He's a good actor. He knows how to make his face convey that, that true love that's beaming from the soul towards this person. So he just looks at her with this incredible affection, which is just heart melting. And, and it says it all in the look, you know, so it's much more satisfying. He also, I like I said, I haven't rewatched like yesterday, but he ha- he almost says nothing. Yeah, in he that scene, say very much. Yeah, he has almost no dialogue, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's also so perfect. It's just all his body acting. The blocking in that scene is perfect. Um, but Kristen, kind of going back to what you were saying about when they interact with each other and they always end up kind of having these fights. So it's going to sound weird, but it kind of reminds me of how I used to have trouble communicating with my mother-in-law where like one of us would say something and the other person interpreted it in a way that was not how the person meant it. And as a viewer, you're like, oh, I know why she took it that way, but that's not what he meant. Or like, oh my God, that's not what she meant. Why are you acting like that? So like you see the fight coming and you're like, no, no, you guys just sit down and talk about it. It's like in the horror movie where you're like, don't go in the basement. Yeah, you're like, oh, no, no, don't, oh, no. <laughs> That's pretty much my whole feeling during the proposal. Like, oh, it I know, it's so, so good. Fast. It's so good, but I'm like cringing the whole time because it's like, he starts off almost immediately like insulting her sympathies about um, being friends with the workers and her like misplaced sympathies. And so it's just like, you're already heading in a bad direction, dude. You need to like back off. And he completely misinterprets her actions at the riot, right? And also his mother completely misinterprets this, which we haven't mentioned her. Oh, she's so, the actress is so So good. So the actress, she's amazing, um, gives a, and I think this is also a testament to Gaskell, who gives us a lot of internal, um, the internal lives of the characters. Like we get a lot from um, Mrs. Thornton, Mr. Thornton, Margaret, and then a little bit, you know, we understand Frederick's motivations and things like that. And so, and Higgins and, um, we don't really see that in Austin as much. There's less internal lives of, of side characters. Oh, so I 100%. think that makes it a really rich, rich story with a lot to like to work with. People who haven't read the book will be very surprised at how much Mrs. Thornton, uh, right? John Thornton's mother is invested in her son to the point of it being quasi borderline sexual. Like when you read the passages where she loves her son so much, she can't bear to think of losing him to Margaret. I wrote, I tweeted, I was like, 
this is so intense. The, her, her knowledge of his physical presence, like his, her awareness of his physical presence at all times, listening for him to come in and, and being despondent when it's not him obsessing over the linens that she's going to lose. And she's going to have to like, you know, re-embroider with a Margaret Hale's initials. She's taking my place. I want one more night with my son to be first in his affections. I tweeted, I was like, even Fanny Price never pined this hard for Edmund. Yeah. And I think Gaskell does an amazing job letting us hear all the characters really immediate personal emotional monologues uh, really are intense. Like I actually um, was reading in my Norton's critical edition, right. Which I can't say enough good things about that. Apparently some of her contemporaries were almost uncomfortable with the language you used. They, they compared Mr. Thornton to a, uh, an ogre in a fairy tale who wants to devour Margaret because every time you, you read about what he's thinking, what he's feeling, it's, it's incredibly intense. So I think Mrs. Thornton's relationship is super, that relationship is super interesting because she lost her husband. Right. And then Mr. Thornton steps up to be the head of the family. And there seems to be like a misplaced um, affection that starts moving towards Mr. Thornton it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but also I understand where it's coming from because her and Mr. Thornton were kind of like two peas in a pod. We're going to like, this family's going to survive. We're going to work hard and pay back all our debts. And it leaves Fanny, the sister sort of like on her own. And in the, in the miniseries, I love that performance too. Uh, Joe Joyner is great as Fanny, but she's also kind of flighty and like silly. And I actually feel a little bad for her because it seems like it's a Mrs. Thornton, um, Mr. Thornton thing and Fanny's sort of the odd one out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of a bummer for her. Clearly not the favorite child, um, but a great performance. I love watching her on screen every time she's on. Well, I think what's so great about the actress who plays his mother, where I'm trying to look up her name because she's I think so it's good Sinead Cusack. We obviously don't get all the stuff that's in the novel of like her interior, but that actress does such an amazing job of creating that character that we feel it. And rather than having like that relationship with her and her son, to me, it's more like her entire life was invested and her husband was invested in making this business. He is carrying it forward. He carries their whole family legacy. And I mean, she wears doesn't she wear black through the whole thing? Yeah, she does. does. He is always mourning the loss of Mm -hmm. her husband. And so for me, I see it as like kind of an anxiety thing, like the fear of him leaving, but also the fear of losing the mill because that is what their whole family built. Like it is what they spent their whole lives building, trying to make this. Um, So it doesn't cross that line to being weird. Like you just really feel for what is at stake. It's intense. For her. She's very concerned about class. And so the whole novel and the whole miniseries is all about these class struggles between the manufacturers and the workers. And then also sort of the um, the renegotiation of class between the gentry and these new, newly Nouveau rich manufacturers. Rich. Yeah, the manufacturers who are immensely wealthy. She recognizes that their position is actually rather precarious, right? Because once they lose the mill, who are they? They're nobody. Um, they're not these wealthy manufacturers anymore. And so I, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying too about the anxiety of that and the way that um, everybody has class anxiety in this, in this story, all the characters do. I feel like I (laughs) always have to be the one to bring this up. Um, But in adaptations, like I think costuming tells a really important part of story and characters and the costuming in North and South is definitely not an exception. Like I was just saying, she wears black through the whole thing. Margaret's wardrobe from the beginning to when they become more and more not destitute, but less wealthy. The sister, uh, Thornton's sister's outfits are amazing because that's really the like nouveau riche, right? Like they can afford all of the, her body. outfits are garish, cr- like huge ruffles everywhere. Um, if you watch this with an eye on the costume, you will learn a lot about who these people are and what they feel. And it's interesting – Margaret doesn't wear a bonnet. She has this like circular hat, which makes her stand out a lot. And I, I so I, I do appreciate that, that part of it. Her, I wish she had better outfits, but. <laughs> well, I always appreciated too, that she was not like very like skinny. Oh, girl. yes. That mm-hmm. actress is beautiful and With she is like <laughs> voluptuous. Like she's, she's not like a uh, yeah. pinup, <laughs> like she's, but she's lovely. And I, I don't know. 
Margaret is interesting. It's like, she's beautiful. And yeah. And guys like she gets proposal every day and she's always like me, <laughs> <laughs> a handsome woman, me. <laughs> yeah. What? But like she yeah. proposed to one, two, like four, five <laughs> times in this thing. At least three in the miniseries, if we count Mr. Bell's like weird like statements. Hey, you to know, her. It, but ha ha ha, I'd be nice. Uh, and then she's like, yeah, and and I was down. just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna die soon anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was thinking that probably if our listeners are listening to this podcast, they've probably seen the miniseries, but maybe not everybody has read the book or knows the background of, of the book. And so before we go too much farther, I thought we could take um a brief left turn into, into history. Yeah, a half an hour into the podcast. I know. <laughs> we had planned to do this much earlier, but we got too excited. Just talking about Richard Armitage is enough to make anybody excited. And and a lot of things we, we already mentioned uh, that I had made notes of that I wanted people to know. But um, there is something that you should just know about this and this book and how it got started. Adrian, did you want to talk about um, household words or do you... Sure, I can start with that. Okay. Um, so the the book was first serialized in Household Words, which was a journal that Charles Dickens was the editor of. Um, and as far as I can tell, he sort of used it as a vehicle to talk about social issues of the time. He published some of his own work in it. Hard Times was published in that. And um, Gaskell had actually um, come to Dickens' attention after she published Mary Barton. And he was like, hey, come write for me. And so she wrote Cranford, which is um, one of her works that are sort of like little episodic stories. And um, then he was like, hey, this is great. Please keep writing for me. And North and South came about that way. So it was actually originally published in Household Words from like September 1954 to January or sorry, 18. 1854. I was like, wait, what? Are you telling me this thing was written in the 19th? No, okay. No, no, it was serialized between September um, 1854 and January 1855, which is kind of nuts to me to think that people were reading this like a couple chapters a week. Because there are times like there's a break right before the proposal. And so you're just going to wait for your next edition of Household Words to see kind of how this resolves. Um, The first two chapters end with like Henry Lennox arriving in Helston. And so I imagine that the readers are like, oh, yeah, he's there to propose. They probably understood that sort of dynamic. And then they had to wait for the rest of it. Um, But the serialized structure was sort of a a challenge for Gaskell because she had to write it quickly and also write it so that it could be serialized. It could be broken up. And it seems like there were some physical limitations to this, too, in terms of physically printing uh, the story. Dickens was kind of on her about shortening it up. He wanted to hear less about Mr. Hale's decision to leave the church. He just wanted her to, like, tighten it up, which was, as we've uh, sort of joked about Dickens is not known for being a, a, a brief writer. So it's yeah, sort that's, of rich. That's, po- that's really rich of him, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredibly rich of him to be like, the story is getting too long. And he was starting to get concerned about it um, as it was first being serialized. But then eventually it ended up fine. People loved it. Um, and he was happy with it and happy with her work of it. But I'm just like the audacity, sir, of being like, I want you to write for my journal, but not like this. <laughs> um And it was really, I think what's interesting about it, especially from a modern perspective, so I first read it in 2020 in my historical context, is that her audience and the audience of Household Words was were people who weren't part of the industrial north. And so Dickens wanted people to sort of understand these uh, social problems that were incurring with the class struggles up there, with the factories. And in a similar vein, you know, in 2020, I don't know much about that. But it continues to be relevant because it's not like we no longer have class struggles and we're we're still sort of um, talking about similar issues about workers' rights, which I find one reason that the the story continues to resonate as far as the working workers' rights part of the story goes. With with regard to the workers' rights story, I am just really impressed with how both sides are laid out and how actively my brain brain was trying to solve the problem, which sounds really silly, but I was definitely very invested in it. And I would say that it seems to be that what she was arguing for, and tell me if you think that I'm not getting it here, but the view of Mr. Thornton being softened ultimately having more of a moral component to it. It's like, yes, 
we owe it to ourselves to have, run a profitable mill so we can all have income. But I also have a responsibility. And to me, I don't know. I, I just thought that was it was an elegant conclusion for, especially for 18. 18- 54. But then I'm not a historian of that time. I don't really know, but I really liked what she was trying to say. It's like, we have a responsibility to the people who are working in the mills to not only pay them, but also to think, how can we feed them? You know, how can we buy this food wholesale and have a dining hall? Like those, I, those good ideas about quality of life coming in as well. Well, it's just crazy to, even today, it's like crazy to think that people don't understand like having happy and healthy people means that they will work better and like be more productive. And we still struggle with this idea today, but it's like, even then it was very (laughs) new concept. Yeah. You know, what would be a good idea if we didn't (laughs) didn't, like have all of our workers hack up their lungs yeah, and and dying of of fluff on the lungs. Exactly. So is, is in the novel when Margaret first sees Thornton, is it like in the show where, you know, he beats this guy, but it's, and then, but then it's because he's smoking and he could have like fireballed the whole place and he endangered everyone's lives. Is that something that's also in the novel? No, it's not. And it's immensely controversial to people that he does that in the mini series where he's very, he has a very violent reaction. It's totally different in the novel in the novel, he basically goes to meet with Mr. Hale when they arrive to Milton because they're still still searching for a place to live. And Mr. Hale is an inn and Margaret is there. So they're just encountering each other like in a hotel. But the the great part about the way they meet is he's immediately like struck by her. And she invites him to sit down and he was he has having a busy day as a mill owner and was not intending to have a seat, but he feels like the under her command, basically. Um, And he has, there's this funny line about how he knew Mr. Hale had a child, but he imagined her to be like a little girl and not like a woman. So he's very, very um, affected by her presence. And so totally different. He leaves thinking she was rather prideful and that's the interaction. So there's no violent exchange in the mill. Um, But I think the reason, and people don't like this because I think they think the violence in the mill is maybe doing a disservice to Mr. Thornton's character in the book. Um, I think as far as a choice for the adaptation is we had to see really quick the differences between Miss, Mr. Thornton and Margaret Hale. And it was a really quick shorthand to say that he is doing things his way to keep a, his mill safe um, from these very serious dangers that Margaret doesn't understand. And I also think Margaret's Margaret's a prejudiced one in here. She, she's the one that doesn't like tradesmen and manufacturers. And I think that's not that sympathetic to a modern audience. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We this have is to exactly like what I was going to say. Yes. yes. In the book, you really don't like her. The, no. the reason she's, you know, the only reason she didn't like him is because I don't like shoppy people or whatever she mm-hmm. says in the beginning. So this was so necessary to put her off him in a way that modern audiences could understand, understand and sympathize. Well, also, and the actress who plays her is so likable. And I, she doesn't, yeah. everyone keeps talking about how, like, she's very full of herself, isn't. And I don't get that from watching it really at all. I mean, they have, their circumstances have come down so far. Like, she is very clearly, like, kind of ashamed of where yeah. they are now. And, like, she has to put on the apron and, like, do the wash and stuff, like, almost immediately. So everyone keeps talking. Of, and I think this is them, like, also projecting so I actually had not having read the book or having like a connection to it, him beating that guy and her seeing it right away. We understand like, it's just like there are other fights. Somebody does something. The other person interprets it this way. Oh no, but really it was about this, but you didn't know that. But then you also thought this, and it's just like a really physical immediate way of then setting up how they both just completely misunderstand everything the other does. And when he explains it, you, 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 first of all, it's, it's very visceral. You, the audience don't like him either. Then when he explains it to her, well, I dare say a gentleman didn't have to see 300 corpses lined out on a Yorkshire hillside last year. Yeah. You're like, oh, I get it. You care a lot about the safety of your workers and you and care about And that guy endangered mill. every single and person that's there. that's why the entire so business. angry. Yeah, I really. Yeah. Then you're like, what's the big deal? He was smoking. And then you really understand. I remember you having to explain that to, to me, Maggie, when we were watching that scene, because I was like, oh my God. And yeah, I think you're, you're oh, like, just wait, well, just this wait. is the situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it was incredibly well done. And there are some other changes too. Um, 
if we would just like want to quickly list some of the other changes from the book to the movie. I'd, I'd love to hear them as someone who hasn't read the book. If I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Adrian, but they don't go to the grand, the great expedi- the grand, no. the, uh, great the, the great exhibition, the great exhibition. Yeah. In no, London. They don't. they don't. And I actually, really? that's one of my that's favorite so parts yeah. of the mini series. Um, yeah. It just doesn't happen at all. I think um, it sort of takes place of the fact that he goes to London at the end and sort of interacts with her family. So there's um, that takes the place of that, but that whole exchange doesn't happen. And I love that scene because the way, it happens right after the proposal. We have all this tension. They haven't even spoken to each other since that moment. And she's like, you know, strolling and looking at all the wonderful things. She finds this whole thing great. And then she turns a corner and there's Mr. Thornton amongst all these wonderful exhibits. And he's just one of them too, um, talking to people about his theories on on strikes and, and workers' rights and stuff. And he, I think it's really impactful for us to see Mr. Thornton in a different light, like amongst his fellow or amongst people who respect him. As a visionary. And Margaret, yes, as a visionary. And then she defends him to her family. I just love that scene. And it's totally not in the book. <laughs> well, I promise I can tell you exactly why that's there. The people who are writing the screenplay are sitting there and they're like, okay, they are now separated by geography. It has been blah, blah, blah. So this many pages since they were together. How can we figure out a way to have him come to London to be with her because you have to have your two stars continuously interact. <laughs> we have to come up with a way to have them in the same place. And someone's like, well, wouldn't he be at like the exhibition because he is, you know, on the forefront of manufacturing. I thought this insertion was more thematic, right? Because oh, that's here we have. For sure. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Okay. So we have like this, this, this uh, movie is about things changing in progress. It's a social problem kind of a story. And we have to talk about, you know, progress. And so this grand exhibition is about progress and it's about what we're learning. And I just thought it was there so we could see um, Mr. Thornton about to punch Henry Lennox. (laughs) (laughs) I I think from a purely like construction of storytelling reason, you have to come up with a way to bring them together again. And then it's like, well, this is all about like the changing nature of England at the time, the rise of industry. And it also, again, like that's another facet of Thornton where she was like these shoppy people, right? But he's well-respected. He's a visionary. He's on the forefront of manufacturing. He's presenting in front of all of these people in this space that she's awed by. And so it just helps again to like have her come around to him. Talking about Margaret's pridefulness, too, and the way social norms are changing in the North versus the South, how much did you love that she meets Nicholas and Bessie Higgins? And she's like, yo, what's your name? What's your address? And they're like, why? She's like, I'm going to bring a charity basket by. And and, And Nicholas Higgins is like, I don't like strangers in my house. Like, I just love that smackdown. It To me, it was a, ve- a very Jane austen way, uh, a social structure, right? Where the, the quality are still giving you charity. And Emma. No, yeah, but exactly. No, we, we make our own money here. We're making our own way. And we decide, we determine our fates and we don't need your charity. And, um, you know, they, they do need, need help, but they have a, a pride of doing it themselves. And you can't just assume that you're there better, right? And so I just really loved that they kind of got to assert that, that I just defaulted to these assumptions. She's trying to interact with everybody in the North in under her understanding of what it's like in the South. So as a Parsons daughter, she's used to going out and handing out baskets, but that's totally not how you do things in the North. And causes a conflict with Higgins initially, but also with Mr. Thornton and her refusing to shake his hand. She doesn't understand that custom. Yeah. Yeah. That was harsh when she doesn't take his hand. And um, you know what they didn't do? What she does in the book is sort of gives a little bow or a little, you know, she acknowledges him in a different way. In the movie, she just doesn't acknowledge him at all. She's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and it's really rude. That's one. Yeah. Let us, let us part as friends. That's one more interaction. This sort of a missed, missed connection, right? Where they, they could have had a nice moment. If you get the opportunity to touch Richard Armitage, by the way, I really, you must you take, take it. it. And then that moment is mirrored at the dinner the Thorntons give oh, where she yes. finally <laughs> offers her hand to him and says, I'm learning your Milton ways. And you really see, I love that you really see Margaret's character growth because she takes it on board. She realizes yeah. that, that she needs to, to learn and things are different. 
she even makes a she even makes a comment like everything I do it turns like it seems like I've made a mistake. Yeah, she talks to Bessie about that how she can't really adjust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's definitely a growth that makes you really invested in her as a character. Can we talk about that dinner scene? Because that is in the book. And I think they actually do a pretty good job, even though they cut some stuff out at like thematically um, having that go down and the way it goes down in the book. So in regards to touching her hand, the way it's written in the book, he comes in, he shook hands with Margaret. He knew it was the first time their hands had met, though she was perfectly unconscious of the fact. I love that. And then this is actually the first time too, which I think is represented in the miniseries where she sees him as like a powerful manufacturer in a room of his equals. Um, And she's like physically attracted to him in this scene. So um, I'll go ahead and read that. Margaret's attention was thus called to her host. His whole manner as master of the house and entertainer of his friends was so straightforward yet simple and modest as to be thoroughly dignified. Margaret thought she had never seen him to so much advantage. When he had come to their house, there had been always something either of over eagerness or of that kind of vexed annoyance, which seemed ready to presuppose that he was unjustly judged and yet felt too proud to try and make himself better understood. But now among his fellows, there was no uncertainty as to his position. He was regarded by them as a man of great force of character, of power in many ways. There was no need to struggle for their respect. He had it and he knew it. And the security of this gave a fine grand quietness to his voice and ways which Margaret had missed before. Love it. I love all of that. I just love it. <laughs> it's exactly, this is what makes the book great for those that, who haven't That read moment it yet. where you see someone in a new light. Right. And Again, then it's, it's like, just like Emma. Yes, very similar to that. And then she's, the sexual tension obviously is like through the roof in that series. <laughs> I, I just that that physical that moment of physical connection where he was aware of it, it is very similar to like Mansfield Park, where Mary Crawford takes Edmund's arm for the first time, and he has a moment where he f- experiences that physical connection. And and Kristen um, can always bring it back to Mansfield. Yeah, Park. let's always bring it back to Mansfield Park. Um, <laughs> there's something else too. Uh, um, I'm just looking, Adrian, at your notes that you've made about um, North and South and thematically with regard to everyone taking a moral stance. Oh yeah. Yeah. These characters, almost all the characters make some kind of principled stance throughout the book and the mini series. We have, it starts with Mr. Hale leaving the church um, because he can't, you know, he doesn't believe anymore or whatever. Um, Mr. Thornton, develop has his own principles and then develops them further in terms of his relate changing relationship to how he thinks of his workers and his relationship to them. Frederick, of course, with the mutiny. And then Margaret is always trying to do the right thing, even though she kind of messes up a lot. And during the riot, she defends Mr. Thornton because it's the right thing to do, not because she necessarily has any romantic feelings for him, which is that I guess I suppose is open to interpretation, but that's what I think. And he doesn't understand that about her. And Mrs. Thornton doesn't really understand that about her, that she wanted to use herself as a woman to shield him from the violence of numbers. And I think she learns that, oh, sorry, and Higgins. Higgins also has um, obviously taking a principled stance. And so everyone has their own moral compass that they're sort of realigning to each other. And I think that's, um, it's interesting in the way it kind of comes out where everybody learns something from, from the other person in the end, and everyone's really just trying to do the right thing. It really comes out in the dinner party where he calls her out for taking the basket of charity to Boucher's children who are starving. And he says, you're making this worse. You're prolonging this by giving them scraps and helping them scrape along with this strike. You're just making it worse in the end. And that moral clarity of her saying, there was a starving baby and I fed it, you know, and that's when their positions the, the, you see both sides of what they're saying, but you, you see, you also really appreciate that she's calling him to task for, we have to be human beings. We have human compassion. We're not just calculators. And I think that's why he doesn't invest in that scheme at the end. Right. He has a responsibility to his words. Yeah. To the payroll money. Right. If he loses the money, he would not be able to pay them. And, you know, earlier he talks to Mr. Hale about, he has to put business first. But that's a moral decision he makes to not invest that money and not participate in that scheme because he understands his responsibility. And I think that is probably shaped by his interactions with Margaret. Yeah. And his, and his 
father's experience with speculation as well. And all, <laughs> that too, all that, that too. too. That yeah. for me was a big twist because that speculation ends up paying off. And Margaret dividends, benefits right? from it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's so <laughs> does the the yeah. sister, right? Because her yeah. husband, she was her husband. trying to do it. And then she's like, well, you should have done it. Blah, blah. <laughs> I, was, I remember watching it and being like, oh my God, this is the part where like everybody loses their money. Yeah. And it and doesn't he, work out. And, and that morality like, pays off for him. <laughs> yeah, you bonehead. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the end, it kind of does because Margaret, you know, he ends up with Margaret I've and come she saves him. come into some 10,000 pounds. Exactly. Yeah. So she... <laughs> She saves him in the end with it, um, which is an interesting. Tw- I'm just like, what is Gaspel telling us with that part? I'm not sure exactly. I like- think she's telling us that she's an excellent plotter. Seriously, the, the plot, the the design of this story, I think, and from what everything I've seen that the miniseries follows very closely, there's payoff for almost everything that we are told, and it all follow. There are consequences, and everything follows from the things before it. I'm not going to judge Gaskell either for this deus ex machina, all of a sudden Margaret's rich, because that is like a major plot point in every British novel of the, of the like, into money. And 19th I mean, centuries. listen, like, if you, like, look at Northanger Abbey, like, yeah. oh, the last page, so-and-so died and inherited everything. And Eleanor <laughs> yeah. could marry whoever she, okay. Yeah, imagine. Frank Churchill. Yeah. You know, yeah. Pretty much, pretty much the plot device, pretty much everyone just waiting for everyone to die, even though now we're in this brave new world where we manufacture things, people dying and us inheriting their money is a major economic driver of things. I remember reading something once where there's a term for it, and maybe Adrian, you know what I'm talking about, where coincidences in stories and audience never questions a coincidence that is bad for a character, Mm. but they are extremely distrustful of coincidences that are good. So (laughs) like in the movie where someone has like the sniper rifle pointed at them and you just happen to drop something on the floor and lean down right at that moment. And you're like, okay, uh." (laughs) but like you just happen to say like fall in a hole and break your leg. And like that, then we have no problem with that, but it's it's a fortunate (laughs) coincidence or just thing happening that we have so much trouble buying into. That's fair. I'll be more generous with Gaskell for having Henry just not show up at the end. <laughs> <laughs> like, I do confess, I like it better that in the, the series, he's there and it's very clear she did <laughs> not pick him. <laughs> it's like, bye, <laughs> you better go back to London. <laughs> and it's easy to hate Henry in the book too, especially because you hear oh. more of his, his thoughts and in the beginning, when he goes to propose to Margaret, Margaret, he's like disappointed that actually she wasn't lying and that her father's fortune is pretty small yeah. <laughs> and that and he, he, the living is not as valuable as, as he thought it might be. <laughs> yeah, he's a little ickier in the, in the book than in the mini. Yeah, definitely but... icky in the book. So we don't have to have too much sympathy for him. That's fair. Adrian, what compels you, do you think, to write fanfic about North and South? Is there one thing you can put your finger on that made you want to write your own uh, extensions of the stories? There's a lot to work with. There's a lot of really vibrant characters, a lot of complex characters. And then there's so much unresolved sexual tension in the book, (laughs) in the miniseries. The abrupt ending, I think, definitely gets my mind thinking about things. Although I mostly write things that happen before the ending. There's just so much there. And I think um, for me, the love story is great because having them fight over and over again, I'm totally into that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then getting them to kiss, right? We need more kisses in um, North and South. That's my one stance. So I think that's what sort of motivates me. I also think all the themes are interesting. I do try to not side. I do try to include stuff about the strike and that class warfare stuff in my fanfics. Because I think it's interesting to explore those ideas from the perspective of those characters. I do think I make Thornton a little bit more like a benevolent capitalist. Um, I do find it problematic the way he views the world a little bit. And so I do twist that uh, to my liking sometimes. But um, overall, I think it's really fun to play with them as as characters. And I think they're feistier. They're feistier than Darcy and Elizabeth in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, they are. (laughs) That's what draws me to them too, as opposed to other um, romantic um, characters that I love, but uh, certainly are, are less feisty. 
Do you think that that's a key 50 years that have passed in terms of how people talk to each other? So it's not quite as, I mean, she will not take his hand because that's not appropriate, but she'll still yell at his face. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they're so blunt to each other. Yeah. And in the uh, as a side note, in the mini series too, it almost seems like people are delivering their lines in an intentionally rude way a lot of the time. Like you expect, especially her and her mother, you expect them to be a little bit more friendly than they actually are. A lot of people have kind of a listless delivery and then they just don't make eye contact with each other. And um, that was frustrating to me, but leaves a lot of scope for the imagination of how things could have gone differently. Like, you know, why didn't she just smile, you know, or whatever, you know, I don't know. She would have been so much prettier if she smiled. Yeah. If she smiled. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that a lot of the misunderstandings come from Margaret just being really tired all the time too, because <laughs> yeah. she's oh basically yeah. acting, doing a lot of stuff that a servant would do that they can't afford. So she comes in and she's just like falling asleep into her tea because she's just so worn out. And she can't talk about that either. Margaret has a lot of responsibility put on her. In the book, she's the one that has to tell her mom that they're leaving Helston. Oh, it's so awesome. Because her dad just can't man up and to do it. And in the miniseries, we see a lot of that. She's the one, you know, looking for the house. She's the one taking on her mother's illness. She's the one taking care of everybody. And no one's taking care of her except Mr. Thornton, who like steps in with the inquest and likes, you know, sending fruit to everybody. He's the only one that ever stops to think about her. Yeah. I wish my husband would send me fruit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> An $8,000 pineapple. We were trying to do the, or 8,000 pound pineapple. We were trying to do the math on how much a pineapple costs in 1855. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a whole paper on this in Persuasions. Have you read it? The no. um, the journal article on this. Yeah, yeah. In 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 the Jasmine publication, Pers- Persuasions, I have come across an article that did, did that exact calculation. When we talked about Northanger Abbey, I, I think I referenced the figures. I can try to pull it for you. But it is yeah. fascinating. It is fascinating how much time and effort they were spending to produce one $8,000 pineapple. There's been um, a lot of discussion with the uh, pineapples ever since Sanditon came out that made it like a big uh, plot point. And then Kristen, when we were at Jasna, there was a lot of discussion yeah, about yeah, the pineapples. Yeah, because it was in Northanger Abbey. Yeah. Oh, the pinery. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And then, of course, the pineapple also reminds me of sort of a subtext of it. And in in watching it in 2020, I can't help but think about where all this cotton is coming from, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. No, the Caribbean is flooding the market. That's 100%. Right. Yeah. yeah. But in 1855, 80% of British cotton was coming from the American South. So there's no discussion about um, the enslavement of people in the Americas in the book or in the miniseries. Margaret is very, I mean, Margaret's world is so small, but she's only concerned about this immediate suffering that she's seeing. But there were abolitionists in 1855, and Margaret Hale isn't one of them. And obviously, Gaskell probably didn't necessarily want to have that conversation in this particular story. But I do think about it when I watch it, because I'm just like, "Mm, Margaret, what about, you know, where's this cotton coming from? Let's ask some questions here. I think as a reader, that kind of context is super important, especially in, you know, this might be what Kristen was going to say, but the pineapple, my family's lived in Virginia a really long time. And so my mom has tons of pineapple paraphernalia, like Christmas ornaments. I have pineapples on my Christmas tree right now, because that is the sign of hospitality in Virginia. If you go to Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg, there are pineapples all over the place. Um, And that's because for a very, very long time, pineapple was a symbol of Virginia hospitality. Uh, But then if you think about it, why the pineapple? Oh, because of the triangle trade. You can't have pineapples anymore because it's gross. Yeah. Margaret Hale definitely suffers from Jane Austen heroin syndrome where you take a look at her and yes, she's living the circumscribed life of like this sort of the, this is sort of uh, shabby genteel gentry that doesn't have the opportunity to make any money for herself, all of these things. And then when we have this context of today, we look back and a lot of people are looking back at Jane Austen and saying all of these things were happening and are not discussed. And for re- many reasons, they are not discussed. Like you were saying, maybe Gaskell just didn't even want to get into it or couldn't get into it, but that's going on here. And I, I did not make the connection or even think about the provenance of the cotton, even after there's a line in the the miniseries, like, oh, well, the Americans are flooding the market. market. How are they doing that? The cotton coming out of the Caribbean. Even after having all these conversations, I honestly didn't even blink and stop to, to, to ruminate on it until you said that, but there's always a deeper layer. Like Maggie was saying, Nothing takes place in a vacuum. 
right? Some even something that's happening across the world that the characters in the book aren't cognizant of. And that's why I appreciate discussions like this so much about literature and film and these kind of historical contexts, because there's so much more at play here than even is reflected in just like the four corners of the page. That's what we say. That's like a lawyer thing where you say the four corners of the page, but there's so much more outside it impacting the story that you're not aware of until you start learning about the broader context. You know what threw me for a loop also it, the first time I was encountered the story was the mutiny. And it yeah, almost right? seems very tacked on to the story at first. And it does serve a plot purpose because there has to be some cloak and dagger stuff going on. But um, there's like this whole dark secret in their family. Like my brother, he'll be murdered if he steps foot in England or like he'll be arrested and hung for mutiny. Yeah, so, but the reason is because of this principle. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, the mutiny, I think, is supposed to be tied as a, as a, along with the class struggle and the strike. So both mutinies and strikes are disrupting the like natural hierarchy of um, power, either in economy or in the Navy. And there's a weird, there's a reference that I need to look up where Mr. Thornton says something about how we should reinstate some kind of law to like prevent strikes. But the original law is a real law that he's referencing was originally about mutinies. And so oh. he, there's this like, I'll have to find it for everybody, but there's this parallel there about that. And I think that's also another reason why Margaret is hesitant to like reveal the truth of, of um, Frederick to him, because he has very strong opinions about people kind of disrupting the natural order of yeah. things or the status yeah. quo. Yeah. But the, so, but of course we have to establish that it was like a just mutiny. Yes. Well, we only can't just be like, we didn't want to do it. So we like, (laughs) no, there has to be like actual, like it was a just reason to rebel against that authority. Yeah. And I was just kidding when I said we only have his word because they also say the other sailors also testified and we're still hung anyway. Like this, this sort of military, we can't allow any kind of bucking of, of the system. Yeah. But ev- all if you do the- think about it, it certainly makes sense. And Adrian, like, of course, everything you pointed out is correct. This- but just as a casual viewer, it's like, wait a minute. It's Her like, brother is like on? wanted and yeah. can't ever come back. It's very- if, it's, it requires you to do a little bit of thinking about themes. I want yeah. to add one more thing, though, about that, because this also is a part of the miniseries that turns into CSI Milton. And I absolutely lo- I love this part <laughs> of the miniseries. <laughs> She is lying to police officers left and right. She's oh, a no, terrible I wasn't liar. There. Nope. Yeah. I, I would like to admit to being remarkably handsome, but I can't. Um, <laughs> and my favorite piece of Richard Armitage acting is when he's on the stairs talking to the officer and he's trying to figure out why she would lie about it. He's doing this like mental calculation of why did she say she wasn't there? And he's like, okay, I'll take care of it. But it's just like these 30 seconds of amazing acting just all in this face, all in his face. (laughs) Um, But I, and sometimes I try to rank what episodes I like the best. And I think I do like episode two the best, but then episode three starts going with the CSI Milton stuff. And I'm like, man, this is so good. (laughs) (laughs) No, And then the guy gets pushed down the stairs, of course, and dies. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like half an hour of Midsummer Murders in the, in yeah. the middle. Of- yeah. <laughs> okay. That's funny that you mentioned that because one of the only credits that I recognize from the actress who played Margaret was she was on Midsummer Murders. But I mean, she is a British actor, so everybody has to be on Midsummer Murders. It's the law and order. The Classic. UK. With regard to, to the, just bringing it back to mutiny and like bucking the, the existing sociopolitical power structures, I, in my book, it has a foreword by Alan Shelston, my, my critical edition. And he made the point that it's not just about her being from the South. London is also in the South. Mm-hmm. So Henry Lennox, everybody involved in lawyering and gover- governing is on the opposite side, right? They, it, all of the existing, like who we consider quality is all being bucked by what's going on in the North. And so it's not just her being being soft because she was a clergyman's daughter. And I think that's why the mutiny t- ties in as well. It's speaking to the larger power, like a governing power. Oh, well, you know that the uh, like Milton folks just sit around like, well, those political big wigs in London, they don't understand what's going yep. on here. Yeah, they don't understand exactly what, what it's say. like to run a business like this. They meddle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So this doesn't really, I just really wanted to make this point going into how um, everything is kind of two, there's two sides to everything in this. 
the scenes that are shot in the mill, I think are so stunning with Love the them. cotton everywhere, mm-hmm. but it's also, you see it and you see what happens to Bessie. And so while it is so beautiful yeah. visually, you know, that the people breathing this in, it's killing them. Um, and then also even like the slightest spark could send the whole place up. So it is beautiful, but it's also incredibly dangerous. And I think there's even just that, like, and that might be another reason why we have the Thornton beating the guy is just mm-hmm. to establish like every day walking into this place is dangerous. You breathe it in, it kills you. If there was a fire, it kills you. It's so awful and visceral that we feel it. And Mark, we know how Margaret feels about it. And then she gets to narrate. I have seen hell. And it is Snow White. Yeah. I and love then, that line. I oh love that line too. And then the and music. Then walks Isn't that the, the end of the first yeah. episode? And, and he the walks. music swells and yeah. you're like, oh my God, this show is so good. Amazing music. So apparently I'm just the- have to go watch it right after this now, aren't I? I'm just going to have to pay whatever Amazon yeah, wants you, me to you, pay. I'd have you, to watch you, it. Jeff Bezos, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was you who told me this, Adrian, but the, um, the cotton mill and the machinery is actually, was, it's a museum in Yorkshire where yeah, they have a full setup mill. And I guess they just use that for the movie. They're like, oh, Hey, wow. you have this. We're going to, is that yeah. the case? I think yeah. That's why it looks so good. Cause it's a that's real so interesting, it's incredible. It's, it, it's so rich and, and awesome that you can see the historical, like the, the way it was actually set up and yeah. And all the fluff and this argument about the wheel, I'm not going to swallow enough cotton. I'm going <laughs> to feel more hungry. I mean, it's absolutely wild. You know, in the beginning, uh, the beginning of the movie, Helston is so beautiful and so <laughs> idyllic and it is my fantasy of living in this charming English village and it <laughs> physically hurt me to read about them having to leave it. I, I was devastated and yeah, it's like and, Hobbiton, right? And then it's just so green and there's so many flowers everywhere. It has like a filter on it though. And yeah, like, no, it does. It has like the golden filter, yeah. glowing filter. Yeah. yeah. It's idealized when Margaret, when they all go up to Milton, Margaret says, in the movie, it's not another planet, but But then the contrast is so great that it might as well be right. Everything, everything is utterly colorless. And Um, then when we have him going to Helston and he's looking at the, we have Mr. Thornton going to Helston and at the end that happens a little earlier in the book and it's sort of a passing reference um, and doesn't become important again until he shows her the rose. But um, in the movie, it's so well done because it's like, He's lost his mill and instead of, you know, despairing about it, he's just going to go be with Mar- Margaret's presence, I guess. Yeah, the, the yeah. comforting presence of something that Margaret loved to sort of understand her better. Um, and I think she really like saves him there because I think he would probably be despairing otherwise. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, it felt a little bit like Darcy diving into the pool. It felt like a, a cleansing, like almost mm-hmm. ritual for him to go down there and bathe himself in Margaret, because that's what he has left, right? His his overwhelming, love. abiding, deep love. And of course, he goes after he learns the big news that it was Margaret's brother. Thank you, Higgins. Yeah, thanks, Higgins. <laughs> thanks for bringing that up when you could have mentioned it a bazillion times. And then like Mr. Bell is going to tell him and then he... It's like, fuck you. I'm not going to tell you. You wouldn't shake my hand. That was such a good scene. What they did with Mr. Bell, it, Bell was, is I liked it a lot more in the movie because in the book, he's in there very briefly and then he immediately yeah. dies and like, well, wow. Um, and Mr. <laughs> Bell's pants also deserve a shout yes. out. That man was a snappy shout dresser. Out. Snappy shout dresser out, for yeah. sure. Those I liked men. him a lot. He had that kind of vibe. Oh God. What's that actor's name? The guy who was in Mad Men. Who played the like silver fox guy? Roger in Mad- Sterling. Yes, he had that like Roger Sterling silver fox vibe. Yeah, he did. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's a he's a creepy guy. This goddess, you know, he's like <laughs> creeping all over her all the time. I didn't yeah, think he was creepy in the in the miniseries, at least. Oh, he's bit. totally creepy. Oh, um, disagree, Kristen. Sorry. Well, any any final thoughts, Adrian? One of your fanfics is about the dinner scene, right? Oh, yes. Um, yeah. One of them is about the dinner scene. I just rewrote, um, I did a couple versions of the dinner scene as like one shots because um, we're always constantly on Twitter talking about like, well, what if this had gone differently? Or like, there's this really great moment in the miniseries where one of the other mill masters is like, um, hey, who's that? And Thornton just totally ignores him and goes and talks to Margaret. Totally <laughs> denies him an introduction. Um, I love that scene. And so I wrote like a version of that um, kind of playing out. 
but the, it's just, the dinner scene is just so rich with attention and the looks between them. So yeah, I, just, I have a couple of those. But my favorite, my favorite fanfic of mine is um, the Christmas one I wrote because I get them Aww. locked in a room during Christmas <laughs> and they have to talk it make out. out. Oh. And eventually, <laughs> yes, make out. But they have to talk it out first. Because the whole time I'm watching this or reading this, I'm just like, just talk to each other. Just talk to each other and stop crossing, um, crossing I don't know, circuits or whatever. Um, and let's get everything out about Frederick and whatnot. But um, yeah. Well, and tell folks how they can find you on, on AO3. Um, so my screen name on AO3 is Eliza G1. And you can also find me on Twitter at Barely Tolerable. The last L is actually a capital I because Barely Tolerable was taken. But you'll be able to find me. And I'm constantly talking about North and South or Pride and Prejudice um, and various other little things. Um, we have a lot of fun out there on Twitter. Yeah, we really do. And um, it gets more fun all the time. And it? In well, North and South sometimes Twitter, I feel, yes. Sometimes I yeah. feel like I'm missing out on Twitter, and then sometimes it just sounds like a garbage heap. And I just like, depends on who you follow. It all depends on who you follow. I'll just and how follow you, you and Adrian. <laughs> that see, that's fun. Then your Twitter experience will be great. You have but, to use the block button otherwise, and the mute, <laughs> muting words. I am a proponent. Yeah, of that. yeah. But you're right, Maggie. I mean, I, I did a tweet about. um how I, I wanted I wanted to work on adapting Mansfield mm-hmm. Park for the screen, but I don't feel that a white woman should do it alone because there's been so much dialogue needed, necessary dialogue that that it shouldn't be a white woman doing it alone. There's people of color need a voice in the writer's room, and that's one place where they definitely need a voice in the writer's room. But anyway, somebody responded to me and she was like, you sound like a horrible race, you know, a white person. You sound like a horrible racist. And it, like reverse racist. Yeah. And I was just like my, that was like when my beautiful Austin corner of the world was a shattered a bit. It, mm. it was like these weirdos come out of the woodwork. Yeah. Just block them. You just have to just be like, it's the background noise of the internet. Block, 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 really, block. I was really excited about it because people don't love Mansfield park enough. And the person who adapts it has to be really interested in Mansfield <laughs> park. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it was, it's a pipe dream. My husband keeps pushing me and pushing me to do it, but I don't know how to screenwrite. First of all, I'm not a, a, an Austin scholar. I'm not the right person to do it, but I had this wild hair where I was like, maybe I'll do it, but no. <laughs> so, but yeah, Austin Twitter is fun. So are there any other last thoughts about the movie? Anything pressing we didn't want to forget to say? I have to just go watch it as soon as I know. Done here. I hope they didn't want to watch anything. <laughs> sorry <laughs> we just got a new tv too so it's gonna be like richard armitage will be Oof. huge yes please um no we didn't say the word brooding enough or smoldering <laughs> or smoldering i do have more passages marked if we want to have a bonus round of uh <laughs> of reading sexy stuff what what think. minute mark are we at Crystal? yeah i am curious too of what you marked as sexy <laughs> Okay, but, just do it. Just do it. And Give I, it to me. I'm going to close I, my eyes. Okay. <laughs> I say I had sexy stuff marked, but everything I'm finding is about his mom. Which is kind of sexy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was sitting here already. Okay, I'm ready. Fit, find something and read it to me. So this is a passage where he has already proposed to Margaret and is meditating. She has been turned down. And is meditating. And I just kind of wanted to give people like an idea. Like this is not necessarily the best one. But was he bewitched by those beautiful eyes, that soft, half open, sighing mouth, which lay so close upon his shoulder only yesterday? He could not even shake off the recollection that she had been there, that her arms had been round him once, if never again. He only caught glimpses of her. He did not understand her altogether. At one time, she was so brave and at another so timid, now so tender and then so haughty and regal proud. And then he thought over every time he had ever seen her once again by way of finally forgetting her. He saw her in every dress, in every mood, and did not know which became her best. Even this morning, how magnificent she had looked, her eyes flashing out upon him at the idea that because she had shared his danger yesterday, she had cared for him the least. Um, there's also a part where really he good. thinks, think, thank you. There's also a part where he thinks about her and he can feel 
her arms around him, the he, soft clinging of her arms around him once again, and his he flushes darkly, and it's it's all very exciting. <laughs> it's, oh, I have that one. He could not forget the touch of her arms around his neck, impatiently felt as it had been all the time. But now the recollection of her clinging defense of him seemed to thrill him through and through, to melt away every resolution, all power of self-control, as if it were wax before a fire. That's very good. <sighs> That's really hot. Maybe yeah. there's a, oh shit, maybe there's an audiobook where Richard Armitage reads it. No, but there is, does exist. And I don't know how this came about and I'm very curious about it, but there is like a little SoundCloud link where he reads the proposal from the book and it's only like a minute long. And I don't know who got him to do this, but it's not the full book. I can send that link to you for sure. There was a couple years ago, there was a company, there was like a tea company. Oh God, this was in like 2006 or something as a big uh, commercial kind of thing. They got a bunch of British actors to read small portions of classic. It might have um, been that literature, because I remember someone did the proposal scene from Pride and Prejudice, and there were a bunch of other like hot British guys reading hot British literature. Uh, so maybe <laughs> this is part of that. Yeah, it might be. Um, but exists like it seems like to secretly exist on the internet. It's not on YouTube, so maybe one day he'll read it though as an audiobook. I read it. What was the audio book that he read, Kristen? I'm trying to find the, the name of the book. Oh, yes. It was called The Jane Austen Society. It was episode 52, The Jane Austen Society, an author interview with Natalie Jenner. And uh, so you can check that out if you want to hear that interview with her. That was really fascinating to hear how that all came about. And the book was really good, too. I yeah, really I really the enjoyed the book, the book a lot. I definitely recommend the audio book and just reading the book. But you can hear Richard Armitage read it to you. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Why spend the time using your own eyes uh, nope. <laughs> when you can use your ears? So should we bop to the wheat sheaf really fast? And then let's we'll go. Do- Come on, Adrian. We're going to go down the lane. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> so I have to apologize. Um, I have gotten emails. I have not responded to them yet. And my personal life, I have been a complete mess with electronic correspondence. And so I apologize. I am actually. Um, I just accepted a job interview and I am about to move to Portland, Oregon. And so I think my time a job offer. Yes. What did I say? Interview? God, interview. Starting in, just ride. That's exciting. I, I accepted a job offer in, in Portland. Yeah. And so I'll be moving there. And so I think the beginning of 2022 for podcasts might be a lot more commentaries and a lot less. Uh, we can well, do North and South commentary. Oh yeah, we totally could. I don't know a single person in Portland. So they have excellent I, donuts there. You'll be fine. Yeah, they and do. I, I, yes. We're freaked out and we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And I had a lot of work when I was interviewing as well. So I apologize that I, it has totally knocked me off posting on Facebook, responding to emails, everything. Kristen, I can also respond to emails. Just forward me any, you don't think that you can get oh, to. Oh, thank you. I'll well, I know you're busy to. too. I know you're busy too. I can respond to emails. Come on. Um, that baby <laughs> goes to bed at six 30. <laughs> I just sit around on my butt and watch TV, but not North and South apparently, but I'll fix that tonight. <laughs> Yes, definitely get on that. But I wanted to um, apologize to Lauren and I will get back to you. She referred me to some Mrs. Rushworth fan fiction, oh which God, is exciting yes. to me because, because I had, think I said on one of the podcasts, my, like our John Mullen podcast, like, you know what I really want to read? I know she's out there in the remote farmhouse. I know there are men out there fair, few and far between, but Come on, Mariah's already lost all her her uh, her dignity, right? Why not just have an affair in the hayloft? And so, yes, apparently it involves meeting General and Captain Tilney in this remote Ooh. little town. So it's bringing them both together. And so let me tell everybody the title of this fanfic. It's called Making the Best of a Bad Lot. And uh, the author is Amelia Marie Logan. And apparently you can find it on her webpage. Um, That is very fun. I will post that um, to the Facebook page when I remember to do that. And then also want to say thank you to Emily, who sent us an amazing list of thoughts on Mansfield Park. And I intend to fully address it when I have time because it's an amazing email and I haven't even read it all the way through yet. So that's me. I'm a mess. 
maybe I should cut that out and just pretend like I can't access my email account right now. (laughs) But um, thank you for those who didn't email. And we always appreciate hearing from everyone. And I will get back to you soon. Uh, Any other business, Maggie? Uh, How is Alex doing? Alex is doing wonderful. He's nine and a half months now. He can stand very well. He's obsessed with trying to climb everything and everyone. He can't walk, but he just like wants to climb. He wants to go up, not across. He's a super fast crawler. He woke up on Thanksgiving day and started baby babbling. So like, so he just like babbles to himself all the time. It's really cute. He's such a cutie. He's very cute. I'm very lucky that he's cute. I don't know what I would do if I had an ugly baby. I I would think he was cute. Right. But then like, it's, I I just hope that people aren't lying to me when they tell me that they, no, he's not. (laughs) I mean, they're not, he is cute. He's, he's wonderful. He is what you would call an active child. Like even the daycare provider is like, he's very active. And we're like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. He is never still. He has to be doing something. Even on the changing table, he will throw a fit and then you just hand him something. And he's like, (laughs) oh, this is fascinating. (laughs) He's just like so endlessly curious. And yeah, we are. He's basically, we were watching Home Alone last night because it's one of our every year Christmas movies. And Bay looks at me and he goes, we can never let Alex watch this movie because we give him <laughs> ideas. He is Kevin McAllister. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kristen. He's doing great. He loves daycare and I'm happy awesome. to be back at work. So. Awesome. Adrian, any other projects planned, any more fanfic or other writing or anything you want to plug? Yeah. You know, we sometimes reread North and South. We did it over the summer. And I think we'll probably do that again um, in the spring or summer um, for anybody who wants to read it for the first time or read it with us on Twitter. Um, But definitely check out my fanfics. I'm on fanfiction.net and archive of our own. They're the same. Eliza G1. And I do have a Christmas fic. So if it's winter time, it's uh, when you're hearing this, it's a great time to check it out. And I think I'll be adding a chapter to that as sort of a fun new, new treat to add to the to the story. Um, I'll continue to revisit Margaret and Mr. Thornton probably for a while. Can you do some more CSI Milton fan fiction? <laughs> that is um, like, <laughs> I guess when about you, that, but yes. When, when you said, the first thing I thought when you said, well, Margaret and Thornton end up in a locked room. I was like, it's a locked room mystery. <laughs> <laughs> they have to solve a murder. That is on my list of ideas because I think they would work. It'd be really funny to make them work together when they're in conflict. Um, but yeah, CSI Milton. What if someone definitely... gets murdered in the mill? We'll think about And he this. has to solve it right away because otherwise they'll shut down the mill for the investigation. Why don't you write this, Maggie? I am not. I, really, I am an. I'm not good at the actual writing. I'm the idea person. But I'm, <laughs> I, that is 100 percent true. If you give me something, like I might. I, I don't. I'm not a. I'm. I write for work. I don't write for pleasure. I just can't yeah. do it. It's definitely a plug too for anybody to to be writing fan fiction. I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's fun that people put out this stuff for free. Um, and some people obviously you have to to buy the fanfics. But um, the more North and South fanfics we get, the better. Agreed. And with that, we just want to say thank you so much for doing this, Adrian, and taking all the time, investing all the time in this and dealing with our, our scheduling <laughs> issues. We're all in different time zones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it's always hard to, to get together, right? But we extremely appreciate your interest and everything you brought to the discussion. And we could not have done this without you. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And it was, it was great chatting with you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. (laughs) It's great. If we do North and South commentary, we could have Adrian join us. Yeah, if if you're interested, we would love to have you. Always happy to talk about North and South. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And Adrian, what do we say? We have delighted you long enough. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye.